From the inception of the sport to modern day, no single idea has created as much worldwide intrigue, speculation, or full-out drama than the concept of pitting man versus woman in a game of tennis. We've seen this idea play out only a handful of times throughout history, most notably in 1973's Battle of the Sexes, where the match between Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs broke records as the most watched televised sports event and remains the most watched tennis match of all time. 50 years later, and we have yet to see a follow-up event reach anywhere near that magnitude of spectacle. Though many would argue that the original purpose of the event was achieved, as that match set the stage for financial equality in men's and women's tennis and helped lend credence to the women's liberation movement as a whole, the immense popularity, media coverage, and worldwide interest in expertly organized exhibition match between the best men's and women's tennis players would draw wouldn't be in question. After all, haven't you ever wondered how one of the all-time female greats such as Serena Williams would do in a match against a man of similar caliber? Well, here's a little hint. It's happened before. Today, let's go over the few examples we have of real-life Battle of the Sexes events throughout tennis history, their results, and why we probably won't see another one for a long time. Round one. Fight. Much of the initial fanfare regarding the idea of a tennis match showcasing man versus woman was because of this man, Bobby Riggs. One of the world's best tennis players throughout the 1940s, having been ranked number one on multiple occasions and having six major titles to his name, Riggs was known just as much from his professional years as he was for his post-tennis career, a tennis promoter, hustler, and gambler. Always looking to profit off his talent, Riggs bet on himself to win the 1939 Wimbledon singles, doubles, and mixed doubles events all in the same year, which he did, and netted today's equivalent of $2 million as a result. In the early 1970s, he publicly criticized women's right advocate and top female player Billie Jean King, who at the time was championing for equal pay of all tennis players regardless of gender, saying, A woman's place is in the kitchen and the bedroom, and not necessarily in that order. Post-retirement, Riggs saw an opportunity to both make money and draw attention to the sport of tennis by making the bold claim that even at 55 years old in 1973, he could still beat any of the then top-ranked female players half his age in a match due to the fact that women's tennis was far inferior to men's, and formally challenged Billie Jean King, who he called the sex leader of the Revolutionary Pact, to a high-profile and highly lucrative winner-takes-all exhibition match to settle the matter. King declined, knowing that a loss would be detrimental to her cause, and in her place stepped Margaret Court, who at 30 years old was in the midst of her seventh straight year of being the number one ranked female player, and to this day holds the record of 24 Grand Slam singles titles, the most of any woman in history. Court wasn't interested in the fight for women's rights, but instead the promising paycheck and even negotiated with Riggs to raise the prize money as she was confident in an easy win. The result? Wasn't pretty. A day now known as the Mother's Day Massacre, 55-year-old Riggs shocked the world with a decisive 6-2, 6-1 defeat over Court, who was befuddled by Riggs' compilation of junk shots which primarily included drop shots, lobs, and soft-paced ground strokes to throw off Court and routinely break her concentration and confidence. A win which earned him a place on the cover of Sports Illustrated in Time, Riggs was beside himself and publicly taunted King regarding his win. Though Court had no plans to further the agenda of equal opportunities and pay for women, her role in the match ultimately proved harmful for the movement. And with that, Billie Jean King finally agreed, with everything on the line, to a second match, which would ultimately be dubbed what we now know as the Battle of the Sexes. With the stakes so high, the match was billed as a once-in-a-lifetime spectacle, with record attendance in person and on TV, and players entered the Houston Astrodome with style akin to Roman gladiators. With the odd makers now heavily favoring Bobby's odds following the previous match, Riggs started off strongly and took control of the first set, using the same junk tactics as the previous match to throw off the hard-hitting Billie Jean King. This time though, she was ready. Rather than approach the net as usual, she stayed at the baseline and pushed the elderly Riggs around the court, forcing him to tire. Riggs dropped the comedy routine and began serving and volleying to stay competitive in the match, but by then it was all over. Billie Jean's straight set victory over Bobby Riggs would prove a pivotal moment for women in tennis, a match that paved a path for equality in a sport dominated by male chauvinism. Though a 2013 ESPN special report fueled already decades-long speculation that Riggs used his heavy odds in the match to bet against himself and through the match to pay off gambling debts, this has not been decisively proven, and the extravaganza of a match would go down as one of the greatest moments in sporting history, with a feature film about the match released in 2017. 
Though the first two Battle of the Sexes exhibition matches are widely known throughout the sporting world, many aren't aware that a third heavily promoted man vs. woman exhibition, entitled Battle of Champions, took place 19 years later in 1992, with a 75-year-old Bobby Riggs confidently taking on 19-year-old teenager Whoops, wrong script. Took place 19 years later in 1992, which saw two all-time greats, 40-year-old Jimmy Connors and 35-year-old Martina Naratilova, duke it out in the desert of Caesar's Palace. Unlike the political nature of the previous two matchups, this event was created purely for fun, entertainment, and of course, money. A handicap system was also introduced, with Jimmy Connors only allowed one serve per point, and Naratilova allowed two additional feet of alley on Jimmy's side. Despite the restrictions, Connors prevailed 7-5-6-2 in what amounted to a somewhat awkward, unconvincing display of gender dominance. Aside from the handicap rules limiting the true nature of man versus woman that the match attempted to showcase, the stars playing were both players either at or close to retirement age, and the tennis on display proved slow and lackluster compared to what tennis fans were used to seeing at normal tournaments. The most exciting part of the night was of information only uncovered 20 years later, when Connors reveals in his autobiography that a serious gambling problem led him to bet $1 million that he would beat Naratulova in straight sets and lose no more than 8 games total. Despite all the hype and pandemonium these previous three examples created in their execution, one major flaw many would argue is that none of the matchups created a match under the real conditions spectators were aching for as in a male and female tennis player facing off, in the prime of their respective careers, with no handicaps imposed. A true, what-if scenario that has never been answered. Well, until the 98 williams bra showdown. So listen to this. In early 1998, the Williams sisters were on the cusp of becoming international tennis stars, and this man, Karsten Brosh, was a fading tennis pro ranked 203 in the world with a funny serve whose training routine was described as being centered around a pack of cigarettes and more than a couple bottles of ice-cold lager. The association? During the 98 Australian Open, the Williams sisters brazenly claimed that they could be any man ranked outside the top 200 in rankings. Brosh, meeting this requirement, accepted the challenge and took them both on one afternoon after a round of golf and two beers. Okay, I know I implied it would be a match at the height of each other's careers, which this match certainly wasn't, but hey, it's the best we got. Alright, the result? Brosh beat Serena Williams in a set 6-1 before taking on Sister Venus and beating her as well 6-2. Brosh later commented that there was no chance the sisters could be any man ranked in the top 500, and he played like someone ranked 600 just to keep the matches interesting. The Williams sisters would later revise their claim to being able to beat any man outside the top 350, though as it stands today, they have yet to accept any further male opponents. In the years since, hypothetical matchups have been proposed every so often, though no serious offers have ever come to fruition. Controversially, John McEnroe came under fire when during an interview in which he was asked about the greatest ever tennis players. Let's talk about Serena Williams. Best female player ever, no question. Uh, some would say she's the best player in the world. Why qualify it? Oh, oh, she's not, you mean the best player in the world, period? Yeah, best tennis player in the world. You know, why, why say female player? Well, because if she was a, if she played the men's circuit, she'd be like 700 in the world. Faced with immense backlash due to his attitude appearing flippant towards her storied career, he would double down on his statements, even throwing out the idea to combine the men's and women's tours if people really were interested in seeing who was the best. I'm yes, just waiting. Would wait. you like to apologize? Uh, no. Um. With that in mind, although the idea of arranging a future battle of the sexes between the world's best male and female tennis players appears novel on paper, the time and place for a serious event may have passed us by 50 years at this point, as there is no longer a need to justify if women really can beat man. The WTA has since shown it can succeed on its own merits, thanks in part to King's efforts in 73. In fact, many would argue that if a man were to beat a woman handily today in a contested match, the precedent set may only act as a silly means of argument to justify why a woman should be paid less, or get taken less seriously, a stigma no amount of money is worth. Though we may one day again get to relive tennis's battle of the sexes with some new exhibition match featuring players playing casually or just for fun, it's doubtful anyone will ever see a true showdown of the best male and female tennis players facing off, and in the end, maybe it's better that way.